the book of good counsels from the sanskrit of the hithopadesha by sir edwin arnold this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jyoti taravanat peace when the time came for resuming instruction the king's sons said to vishnu sarman master we have heard of war we would now learn somewhat of the treaties which follow war it is well asked replied the sage listen therefore to peace which hath this commencement when those great kings their weary war did cease the vulture and the goose concluded peace how came that asked the princess vishnu sarman related the treaty between the peacocks and the swans so soon as king jewel plume had retreated the first care of king silver sides was the discovery of the treason that had cost him the fort goose he said to his minister who put the fire to our citadel think you was it an enemy or an inmate sire replied the goose night cloud and his followers are nowhere to be seen it must needs be his work it must needs be sighed the king after a pause but what ill fortune if it please your majesty no replied the minister it is written it's the fool who meeting trouble straight away destiny reviles knowing not his own misdoing brought his own mischance the whiles you have forgotten the saying who listens not when true friends counsel well must fall as once the foolish tortoise fell i never heard it said the king how was that the goose related the story of the tortoise and the geese there is a pool in south bihar called the pool of the blue lotus and two geese had for a long time lived there they had a friend in the pool who was a tortoise and he was known as shelly neck it chanced one evening that the tortoise overheard some fishermen talking by the water we will stop here tonight they said and in the morning we will catch the fish the tortoises and such like extremely alarmed at this the tortoise repaired to his friends the geese and reported the conversation whatever am i to do gossips he asked the first thing is to be assured of the danger said the geese i am assured exclaimed the tortoise the first thing is to avoid it don't you know time not come and quick at peril these two fishes scaped the net what will be will be he perished by the fisherman's beset no said the geese how was it shelly neck related the story of fate and the three fishes it was just such a pool as this and on the arrival at it of just such men as these fishermen that three fishes who had heard their designs held consultation as to what should be done i shall go to another water said time not come and away he went why should we leave unless obliged asked quick at peril when the thing befalls i shall do the best i can who deals with bad dilemmas well is wise the merchant's wife with womanly device kissed and denied the kiss under his eyes how was that asked the other fish quick at peril related the story of the unabashed wife there was a trader in vikrampura who had a very beautiful wife 
and her name was Jewel Bright. The lady was as unfaithful as she was fair, and had chosen for her last lover one of the household servants. Ah, womankind! Sex, that tires of being true, base and new, is brave to you, like the jungle cows ye range, changing food for sake of change. Now it befell one day that the jewel bright was bestowing a kiss on the mouth of the servant. She was surprised by her husband, and seeing him she ran up hastily and said, My lord, here is an impudent valet. He eats the camphor which I procured for you. I was actually smelling it on his lips as you entered. The servant, catching her meaning, affected offence. How can a man stay in a house where the mistress is always smelling one's lips for a little camphor, he said, and thereat he was for going off, and was only constrained by the good man to stay, after much entreaty. Therefore, said Quick at Peril, I mean to abide here, and make the best I can of what befalls as she did yes yes said what will be will be we all know that which will not be will not be and what is to be will be why not drink this easy psyche antidote of mystery when the morning came the net was thrown and both the fishes enclosed quick at peril on being drawn up feigned himself dead and upon the fisherman's laying him aside, he leaped off again into the water. As to what will be, will be, he was seized and forthwith dispatched, and that concluded the tortoise, is why I wish to devise some plan of escape. It might be compassed if you could go elsewhere, said the geese, but how can you get across the ground? Can't you take me through the air? asked the tortoise. Impossible said the geese not at all replied the tortoise you shall hold a stick across your bills and i will hang on it by my mouth and thus you can readily convey me it is feasible observed the geese but remember wise men their plans revolve lest ill befall the herons gained a friend and so lost all how came that about asked the tortoise the geese related the story of the herons and the mongoose among the mountains of the north there is one named eagle cliff and near it upon a fig tree a flock of herons had their residence at the foot of the tree in a hollow there lived a serpent and he was constantly devouring the nestlings of the herons loud were the complaints of the parent birds until an old heron thus advised them you should bring some fishes from the pool and lay them one by one in a line from the pole of a yonder mongoose to the hollow where the serpent lives the mongoose will find him when it comes after the fish and if it finds him it will kill him the advice seemed good and was acted upon but in killing the snake the mongoose overheard the cry of the young herons and climbing the tree daily it devoured all that the snake had left therefore concluded the keys do we bid you look well into your plan if you should open your mouth for instance as we carry you you will drop and be killed am i a fool cried the tortoise to open my mouth not i come now convey me thereupon the geese took up the stick the tortoise held fast with his mouth and away they flew the country people observing this strange sight ran after ho ho cried one look at the flying tortoise when he falls we'll cook and eat him here said another now let us take him home for dinner cried a third we can light our fire by the pool and eat him said the first 
The tortoise heard these unkind remarks in a towering passion. Eat me, eat ashes, he exclaimed, opening his mouth, and down he fell directly, and was caught by the countryman. Said I not well, concluded the goose minister, that to scorn counsel is to seek destruction? You have well said, replied King Silversides, disconsolately. Yes, your majesty, interposed the crane, who was just returned. If the fort had been cleared, Night Cloud could not have fired it, as he did by the vulture's instigation. We see it all, sighed the king, but too late. Whoso trusts for service rendered or fair words an enemy, wakes from folly like one falling in his slumber from a tree. I witnessed Night Cloud's reception, continued the crane. King Jewel Plume showed him great favour, and was for anointing him Raja of Camphor Island. Hear you that, my liege? asked the goose. Go on, I hear, said Silversides. To that the vulture demurred, continued the crane. Favour to low persons, he said, was like writing on the sea sand. To set the base born in the seat of the great was long ago declared impolitic. Give mean men power, and give thy throat to the knife. The mouse made tiger sought his master's life. How was that? asked King Jewel Plume. The vulture related. The story of the recluse and the mouse. In the forest of the sage Gautama there dwelt a recluse named Mighty at Prayer. Once, as he sat at his frugal meal, a young mouse dropped beside him from the beak of a crow, and he took it up and fed it tenderly with rice grains. Some time after the saint observed a cat pursuing his dependent to devour it, whereupon he changed the mouse into a stout cat. The cat was a great deal harassed by dogs, upon which the saint again transformed it into a dog. The dog was always in danger of the tigers, and his protector at last gave him the form of a tiger, considering him all this while and treating him withal like nothing but a mouse. The country folk passing by would say, That a tiger, not he. It is a mouse the saint has transformed. And the mouse being vexed at this reflected. So long as the master lives, this shameful story of my origin will survive. With this thought, he was about to take the saint's life, when he, who knew his purpose, turned the ungrateful beast by a word to his original shape. Besides, your majesty, continued the vulture, it may not be so easy to conquer Camphor Island. Many fine fishes did the old crane kill, but the crab matched him, Magvir all his bill. How came that to pass? asked Jewel Plume. The vulture related. The story of the crane and the crab. There was an old crane at a mere called Lily Water in Malwa, who stood one day in the shallows with a most dejected look and drooping bill. A crab observed him and called out, Friend Crane, have you given up eating that you stand there all day? Nay, sir, replied the old crane, I love my dish of fish. But I have heard the fishermen say that they mean to capture every one that swims in this water, and as that destroys my hope of subsistence, I am resigning myself to death. All this the fishes overheard. In this matter, certainly, they said, his interest is ours. We ought to consult him, for it is written, Fellow be with kindly foemen, 
rather than with friends unkind friend and foeman are distinguished not by title but by mind thereupon they repaired to him good crane they said what course is there for safety course of safety there is replied the crane to go elsewhere and i will carry you one by one to another pool if you please do so said the trembling fishes the crane accordingly took one after another and having eaten them returned with the report that he had safely deposited each last of all the crab requested to be taken and the crane coveting his tender flesh took him up with great apparent respect on arriving at the spot which was covered with fish bones the crab perceived the fate reserved for him and turning round he fastened upon the crane's throat and tore it so that he perished well but said king jewel plume we can make night cloud viceroy here to send over to vindhya all the productions of camphor isle then the vulture foresight laughed a low laugh and said who e'er he makes again has spent it like the pot breaker will repent it what was that asked the king foresight related the story of the brahman and the pans there was a brahman in the city of vana whose name was deva sarman at the equinoctial feast of the dasara he obtained for his duxina gift a dish of flour which he took into a potter's shed and there lay down in the shade among the pots staff in hand as he thus reclined he began to meditate i can sell this meal for ten cowrie shells and with them i can purchase some of these pots and sell them at an advance with all that money i shall invest in betel nuts and body clothes and make a new profit by their sale and so go on trafficking till i get a lakh of rupees what's to prevent me then i shall marry four wives and one at least will be beautiful and young and shall be my favorite of course the others will be jealous but if they quarrel and talk and trouble me i will belabor them like this and this and therewith he flourished his staff to such a purpose as to smash his meal dish and break several of the potter's jars the potter rushing out took him by the throat and turned him off and so ended his speculations i smiled my liege concluded the vulture at your precipitancy thinking of that story tell me then my father what should be done said the king tell me first your majesty what took the fortress strength or stratagem it was a device of yours said the king it is well replied the minister and my counsel now is to return before the rainy season while we can return and to make peace we have won renown and taken the enemy stronghold let it suffice i speak as a faithful adviser and it is written whoso setting duty highest speaks at need unwelcome things disregarding fear and favour such a one may succour kings O oh, my liege, war is uncertain, nay, it may ruin victor and vanquished. Sunda the strong and giant Upasunda, contending like the lightning and the thunder, slew each the other. Learn the while you wonder. Tell me that, said the king of the peacocks. The vulture related the duel of the giants long ago my liege there were two daityas named sunda and upa sunda the which with penance and fasting worshipped that god which wears the moon for his forehead jewel desiring to win his favour and thereby the lordship of the three worlds 
at last the god propitiated by their devotion spake thus unto them i grant a boon unto ye choose what it shall be and they who would have asked dominion were suddenly minded of saraswati who reigns over the hearts and thoughts of men to seek a forbidden thing if said they we have found favour let the divinity give us his own cherished parvati the queen of heaven terribly incensed was the god but his word had passed and the boon must be granted and parvati the divine was delivered up to them then those two world breakers sick at heart sin blinded and a fire with the glorious beauty of the queen of life began to dispute saying one to another mine is she mine is she at the last they called for an umpire and the god himself appeared before them as a venerable brahman master said they tell us whose she is for we both won her by our might then spake the brahman brahmans for their lore have honour kshatriyas for their bravery vaisyas for their hard-earned treasure sudras for humility ye are kshatriyas and it is yours to fight settle then this question by the sword thereupon they agreed that he spoke wisely and drew and battled and being of equal force they fell at the same moment by an exchange of blows good my lord concluded the minister peace is a better thing than war but why not say so before asked jewel plume i said it at the first replied the minister i knew king silver sides for a just king upon whom it was ill to wage battle how say the scriptures seven foemen of all foemen very hard to vanquish be the truth teller the just dweller and the man from passion free subtle self sustained and counting frequent well won victories and the man of many kinsmen keep the peace with such as these the swan king has friends and kinsmen my liege and the man with many kinsmen answers with them all attacks as the bamboo in the bamboo safely sheltered scorns the axe my counsel then is that peace be concluded with him said the vulture all this king silver sides and his minister the goose heard attentively from the crane go again said the goose to long bill and bring us news of how the vulture's advice is received minister began the king upon the departure of the crane tell me as to this peace who are they with whom it should not be concluded they be twenty namely tarry not to name them said the king and what be the qualities of a good ally such should be learned in peace and war replied the goose in marching and pitching and seasonably placing an army in the field for it is said he who sets his battle wisely conquers the unwary foe as the all awaiting night-time slew the overweening crow counsel my liege is quintuple commencing providing dividing repelling and completing good said the king par is triple continued the goose being of kings of councils and of constant effort it is so said the king and expedience my liege continued the goose or quadruple and consist of conciliation of gifts of strife stirring and of force of arms and thus it is written whoso hath the gift of giving wisely equitably well whoso learning all men's secrets unto none his own will tell whoso ever cold and courtly 
utters nothing that offends such a one may rule his fellows unto earth's extremest ends then king jewel plume would be a good ally observed the swan king doubtless said the goose but elated with victory he will hardly listen to the vulture's counsel we must make him do it how asked the king we will cast our dependent the king of ceylon strong bell the stork to raise an insurrection in jambu dwipa it is well conceived said the king and forthwith a crane named pied body was dismissed with a secret message to the raja in course of time the first crane who had been sent as a spy came back and made his report he related that the vulture had advised his sovereign to summon night cloud the crow and learn from him regarding king silverside's intentions night cloud attended accordingly crow asked king jewel plume what sort of a monarch is the raja silversides truthful may it please you replied the crow and therewithal noble as yudhishthira himself and his minister the goose is a minister unrivalled my liege said the crow king but how then didst thou so easily deceive them ah your majesty said the crow there was little credit in that is it not said cheating them that truly trust you it's a clumsy villainy any knave may slay the child who climbs and slumbers on his knee besides the minister detected me immediately it was the king whose innate goodness forbade him to suspect evil in another believe a knave thyself scorning a lie and rue it like the brahman by and by what brahman was that asked the king night cloud replied the story of the brahman and the goat a brahman that lived in the forest of gautama your majesty he had purveyed a goat to make puja and was returning home with it on his shoulder when he was descried by three knaves if we could but obtain that goat said they it would be a rare trick and they ran on and seated themselves at the foot of the three different trees upon the brahman's road presently he came up with the first of them who addressed him thus master why do you carry that dog on your shoulder dog said the brahman it is a goat for sacrifice with that he went on across and came to the second knave who called out what dost thou with that dog master the brahman laid his goat upon the ground looked it all over took it up again upon his back and walked on with his mind in a whirl for the good think evil slowly and they pay a price for faith as witness crop ear may who was crop ear asked the king of the peacocks the story of the camel the lion and his court a camel may it please you replied night cloud who strayed away from a kafila and wandered into the forest a lion named fierce fangs lived in that forest and his three courtiers a tiger a jackal and a crow met the camel and conducted him to their king his account of himself was satisfactory and the lion took him into his service under the name of crop ear now it happened that the rainy season was very severe and the lion became indisposed so that there was much difficulty in obtaining food for the court the courtiers resolved accordingly to prevail on the lion to kill the camel for what interest have we they said in this browser of thistles what indeed observed the tiger but will the raja kill him after his promise of protection think you being famished he will said the crow know you not 
hunger hears not cares not spares not no boon of the starving beg when the snake is pinched with craving verily she eats her egg accordingly they repaired to the lion hast brought me food fellow growled the raja none may it please you said the crow must we starve then asked the majesty not unless you reject the food before you sire rejoined the crow before me how mean you i mean replied the crow and he whispered it in the lion's ear crop here the camel now said the lion and he touched the ground and afterwards both ears as he spoke i have given him my pledge for his safety and how should i slay him nay sire i said not slay replied the crow it may be that he will offer himself for food to that your majesty would not object i am powerless hungry muttered the lion then the crow went to find the camel and bringing all together before the king under some pretence or other he thus addressed him sire our pains are coming to nothing we can get no food and we behold our lord falling away of the tree of state the root kings are feed what brings the fruit take me therefore your majesty and break your fast upon me good crow said the lion i had liever die than do so will your majesty deign to make a repast upon me asked the jackal on no account replied the lion condescend my lord said the tiger to appease your hunger with my poor flesh impossible responded the lion thereupon crop ear not to be behind in what seemed safe made offer of his own carcass which was accepted before he had finished the tiger instantly tearing his flank open and all the rest at once devouring him brahman continued night cloud suspected nothing more than did the camel and when the third knave had broken his jest upon him for bearing a dog he threw it down washed himself clean of the contamination and went home while the knaves secured and cooked his goat but night cloud asked the raja how couldst thou abide so long among enemies and conciliate them it is easy to play the courtier for a purpose said night cloud courtesy may cover malice on their heads the woodsmen bring meaning all the while to burn them logs and faggots o oh my king and the strong and subtle river rippling at the cedar's feet while it seems to lave and kiss it undermines the hanging root indeed it has been said a wise man for an object's sake his foe upon his back will take as with the frogs once did the snake how was that asked the peacock king the crow related the story of the frogs and the old serpent in a deserted garden there once lived a serpent slow coil by name who had reached an age when he was no longer able to obtain his own food lying listlessly by the edge of a pond he was descried by a certain frog and interrogated have you given up caring for food serpent leave me kindly sir replied the subtle reptile the griefs of a miserable wretch like me cannot interest your lofty mind let me at least hear them said the frog somewhat flattered you must know then gracious sir began the serpent that it is now twenty years since here in brahmapura i bit 
the son of Kaundinya, a holy Brahman, of which cruel bite he died. Seeing his boy dead, Kaundinya abandoned himself to despair and groveled in his distress upon the ground. Thereat came all his kinsmen, citizens of Brahmapura, and sat down with him, as the manner is, he who shares his brother's portion, be he beggar, be he lord, comes as truly comes as duly to the battle as the board, stands before the king to succour, follows to the pile to sigh, he is friend and he is kinsman, less would make the name a lie. Then spoke a twice past Brahman, Kapila by name, O Kaundinya, thou dost forget thyself to lament thus. Hear what is written. Weep not. Life the hired nurse is, holding us a little space. Death, the mother who doth take us back into our proper place. Gone with all their goods and glories, gone like peasants are the kings. Whereunto the world is witness, whereof all her record rings. What indeed, my friend, is this mortal frame that we should set store by it? For the body daily wasting is not seen to waste away, until wasted as in water set a jar of unbaked clay. And day after day man goeth near and nearer to his fate, as step after step the victim thither, where its slayers wait. Friends and kinsmen, they must all be surrendered. Is it not said, like as a plank of driftwood, tossed on a watery main, another plank encountered, meets, touches, parts again, so tossed and drifting ever, one life's unresting sea, men meet and greet and serve, parting eternally. Thou knowest these things, let thy wisdom chide thy sorrow, saying, Halt, traveller, rest I o shade, then up and leave it, stay so, take for of life, nor losing grieve it. But in sooth a wise man would better avoid love, for each loved object born sets within the heart a thorn, bleeding when they be uptorn. And it is well asked, when thine own house, this rotting frame, doth wither, thinking another's lasting, goest thou thither? What will be, will be, and who knows not? Meeting makes a parting sure, life's is nothing but death's door. For truly, as the downward running rivers never turn and never stay, so the days and nights stream deathward, bearing human lives away. And though it be objected that, be thinking him of darkness grim and death's unshunned pain, a man strong soul relaxes hold like leather soaked in rain. Yet is this none the less assured that, from the day, the hour, the minute, each life quickens in the womb, thence its march, no falter in it, goes straight forward to the tomb. Form, good friend, a true idea of mundane matters, and bethink thee that regret is after all but an illusion, an ignorance. As it were not so, would sorrow cease with years? Wisdom sees right what men of knowledge fears. Kaundinya listened to all this, 
with the air of a dreamer. Then, rising up, he said, Enough! The house is held to me. I will betake me to the forest. Will that steed you? asked Kapila. Nay, seek not the wild, sad heart. Thy passions haunt it. Play hermit in thine house, with heart undaunted. A governed heart, thinking no thought but good, makes crowded houses holy solitude. To be a master of oneself, to eat only to prolong life, to yield to love no more than may suffice to perpetuate a family, and never to speak but in the cause of truth, this, said Kapila, is armour against grief. What wouldst thou with a hermit's life, prayer and purification from sorrow and sin in holy streams? Hear this. Away with those that preach to us the washing off of sin. Thine own self is the stream for thee to make ablutions in. In self-restraint it rises pure, flows clear in tide of truth, by widening banks of wisdom in waves of peace and truth. Bathe there, thou son of Pandu, with reverence and right. For never yet was water wet could wash the spirit white. Resign thyself to loss. Pain exists absolutely. Is what is it but a minute's alleviation? It is nothing else, said Kaundinya. I will resign myself. Thereupon the serpent continued. He cursed me with the curse that I should be a carrier of frogs, and so retired, and here remain I to do accordingly to the Brahmin's malediction. The frog, hearing all this, went and reported it to Webfoot, the frog king, who shortly came himself for an excursion on the serpent. He was carried delightfully, and constantly employed the conveyance. But one day, observing the serpent to be sluggish, he asked the reason. May it please you, explained the serpent, your slave has nothing to eat. Eat a few of my frogs, said the king, I give you leave. I thank your majesty, answered the serpent, and forthwith he began to eat the frogs until the pond became clear he finished with their monarch himself i also said night cloud stooped to conquer but king silversides is a good king and i would your majesty were at peace with him peace cried king jewel plume shall i make peace with my vassal i have vanquished him let him serve me at this moment the parrot came in. Sire, said he breathlessly, the stork strong bill Raja of Ceylon has raised the standard of revolt in Jambu Dwipa and claims the country. What? What? cried the king in a fury. Excellent, good, goose, muttered the minister. This is thy work. Bid him but await me, exclaimed the king, and I will tear him up like a tree. Ah, sire, said the minister, thunder for nothing, like December's cloud, passes unmarked. Strike hard, but speak not loud. We cannot march without making peace first. Our rear will be attacked. Must it be so? asked the king. My liege, it must, replied the vulture. Make a peace then, said the king, and make an end. It is well, observed the minister, and set out for the court of the king's silver sides. While he was yet coming, the crane announced his approach. Ah, said the swan king, this will be another designing spy from the enemy. Misdoubt him not, answered the goose, smiling. It is the vulture 
far-sight a spirit beyond suspicion would your majesty be as the swan that took the stars reflected in the pool for lily buds and being deceived would eat no lily shoots by day thinking them stars not so but treachery breeds mistrust replied the rajah is it not written minds deceived by evil natures from the good their faith withhold when hot kanji once has burned them children blow upon the cold it is so written my liege said the minister but this one may be trusted let him be received with compliments and a gift accordingly the vulture was conducted with the most profound respect from the fort to the king's audience hall where a throne was placed for him minister said the goose consider us and ours at thy disposal so consider us assented the swan king i thank you said farsight but with a gift the miser meet proud men by obeisance greet women's silly fancies soothe give wise men their due their truth i am come to conclude a peace not to claim your kingdom but what mode shall we conclude it how many modes be there asked king silver sides sixteen replied the vulture or the alliances numbered therein asked the king no these be four answered the vulture namely of mutual help of friendship of blood and of sacrifice you are a great diplomatist said the king advise us which to choose there is no peace like the golden sangata which is made between good men based on friendly feeling and preceded by the oath of truth replied the vulture let us make that peace said the goose farsight accordingly with fresh presents of robes and jewels accompanied the goose to the camp of the peacock king the raja jewel plume gave the goose a gracious audience accepted his terms of peace and sent him back to the swan king loaded with gifts and kind speeches the revolt in jambudvipa was suppressed and the peacock king retired to his own kingdom and now said vishnu sarman i have told your royal highness all is there anything remaining to be told reverend sir replied the princess there is nothing thanks to you we have heard and comprehended the perfect cycle of kingly duty and our content there remains but this then said the preceptor peace and plenty all fair things grace the realm where ye reign kings grief and loss come not anning you glory guide and magnify you wisdom keep your statesmen still clinging fast in good or ill clinging like a bride new wed unto lips and breast and head and day by day that these fair things befall the lady lakshmi give her grace to all end of peace from the book of good counsels from the sanskrit ithopadesha by sir edwin arnold recording by jyoti taravanath